Now, since we filmed the rest of the section on dark matter, there have been a lot of advances, particularly our understanding, or lack of understanding, of what sort of subatomic particle could actually be dark matter. Now, back when we recorded the rest of the stuff, the leading contender was WIMPs. And as I'd like to show you, they are much less probable now. They've come into some disfavour because of some extremely interesting experimental results. Now, a reminder, what does astronomy tell us about dark matter? Well, it tells us that dark matter must not interact via the strong nuclear force, because if it did, it would muck up all the creation of elements in the early universe. It also can't interact via electromagnetism, because if it does, we'd see it, or would block background light. It must interact via gravity, otherwise it wouldn't be dark mass, it would be dark, invisible, irrelevant thing. And it must... It's probably passing through you right now. That leads one force of nature, the weak interaction, which it might or might not, given we have no idea what it is, have something to do with this force. So, probably, as I stand here, these particles are coming through me. Could we actually measure them experimentally? Now, the main trouble is we don't really know what these particles are. Our standard model of particle physics is called the standard model. And it consists of certain families of particles. There are quarks that make up protons and neutrons and have various other more exotic elements. There are electrons, like electrons and neutrinos. There's a Higgs boson that gives them mass. And there's various particles that transmit force back and forth, like photons that transport electromagnetism and W bosons for the weak force. And maybe gravitons for gravity, if we include that. So that's the standard model of particle physics. And the trouble is, none of these particles can produce dark matter. The closest are the neutrinos. They, we now know, do have a little bit of mass, but their mass is actually too low. They can't expend all the dark matter. They can expend a, a small percentage of it. And because they are so low mass, they move too fast, and so they wouldn't sit in the halos of galaxies. They'd spread out too much, which contradicts the observation. So if we're going to explain dark matter with some sort of weirdo particle, we need a new particle. And that makes particle physicists very excited, because particle physics has been kind of stuck since the 1970s. We have the standard model, all these particles, and one after another they've all been discovered and they've all done exactly what we expect. So we've no clues experimentally. This theory explains every particle ever produced in a particle accelerator and all the behaviour of these particles, how they interact everything. It's too good. When you've got a perfect theory that explains everything, what do you do? Just give up and stop? Well, some of the particle physicists have probably been tempted to just give up and move into something more interesting like, say, astronomy. Not that I'm biased. But there are many things about the standard model that don't quite make sense. Physicists like a very elegant, simple model. And this has got far too many particles with far too many strange masses and strange ratios, none of which seem to make sense. So, for decades now, theoretical particle physicists have been trying to come up with the a more elegant theory that helps maybe explain why you've got this whole family of particles, why they have the masses they do, why they behave the way they do, rather than just, this is the way it is, learn it, suck it up. And one of the most popular ones is supersymmetry. Now we need a theory like this, because if we don't have a theory, we're just looking for a dark matter particle, we have no idea how massive it is, how it interacts, if at all, then any sort of experiment is going to be what we call a fishing trip. That is to say, you cast your line and you hope there's something there. Because any experiment will only look for particular masses or particular sizes or particular interactions, and if you don't see something, maybe it's just somewhere else. But if you have a theory, a theory that says, well, I think it should be in this mass range with this type of interaction, then you can test it. Otherwise, you're just doing a random experiment with no idea if it's going to work or not. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't tell you anything. So we'd like a theory to explain how a, what a dark matter particle might be, and supersymmetry for a very long time was our best candidate. So, supersymmetry was invented not to explain dark matter, but to solve another problem. In fact, several other problems, but the main one is the Higgs boson is the particle that gives all the other particles in the standard model their mass. And if you try and calculate how heavy a Higgs boson should be, You've got various physical constants, and you can combine them to make a mass. And if you do, you get a very large mass, about 10 to the 17 bigger than the Higgs boson's real mass. 
If that was true, all the particles of the universe would weigh 10 to the 17 times more than we do and would be in a very strange universe indeed. Now, it could just be tough, nature's decided to make the mass much less. But of course, the particle physicists would like to come up with an explanation for why the mass is so much little, lower than expected. And there is a possible explanation, which is the mass of any particle doesn't just, just depend on the particle itself. Any particle moving through space is surrounded by a cloud of virtual particles popping in and out of existence from quantum mechanics. And the reaction between the particle and these virtual particles around them totally changes the mass. You have to allow that for the mass of everything, protons, electrons, whatever. If you don't factor that in, you get quite the wrong answer. So, could there be some cloud of particles around the Higgs boson and all the other particles in the standard model that make their mass much less? Well, in principle it can, but to make that happen, you would need a whole bunch of new particles, supersymmetric particles, which could appear around it and cancel out the mass. Another benefit of having all these extra particles is it can help unify the forces. Now over here we have three forces of nature, electromagnetic, weak and strong force. We're not counting gravity, that's just too hard for the moment. And if you extrapolate to higher and higher energies, like closer and closer to the Big Bang, there's no energy at which they all meet. But if we put some supersymmetry and we have these new supersymmetric particles, then they all meet at one point. So in principle, you could unify all these forces, which would be cool. So to make this work, you need all your normal particles and a whole bunch of S particles, which more or less mirror the normal particles. They have a symmetry that makes them match one to one. They have different spin and in particular they have higher masses. And if you have these, it can help explain how you unify all these forces and these virtual S particle particle pairs mysteriously appearing in a cloud around will help cancel out the extra mass of the Higgs boson and give you the nice low mass you observe. So that sounds pretty good. It's a nice, it's a mathematically elegant theory, or rather a whole family of mathematically elegant theories. And could it explain dark matter? Well, these theories do predict that there should be a light particle, probably called the neutralino, which has about the right properties to produce dark matter. Um, it'll have a mass in the range of about 100 to 1,000 giga electron volts, which is a good fit to the data of dark matter. It's not too light like neutrinos. And a cross-section, that means the probability of one hitting something else of very small value, 3 by 10 to the minus 26 centimeters squared per second. But it just so happens that those numbers produce what's called, in the field, the WIMP miracle. Because if you have a particle with those properties, then in the very, very early universe, like tiny fractions of a second, everything would have been very energetic and very violent, and you're constantly getting particle-antiparticle pairs appearing and disappearing. But as, as the energy goes down, eventually the energy drops so low that you can't no longer produce these dark matter particles. You'd think that the dark matter anti dark matter would then annihilate each other, but because space was expanding so fast, some of these particles just get carried apart and can never find their antiparticle, and so they never disappear. And you can calculate this. And what you find is that if you have a particle with these particular properties, this mass, this cross section, you can look at how much of it there should be left over today after what's called this freeze out when the energy drops below the energy that allows them to constantly be created, but some of them survive because they're spread apart by the expansion of the universe. And it turns out to be about near 20-25% of the current critical density of the universe, which matches the density of dark matter. So that's pretty exciting. So we've got this candidate, these WIMPs, and if they exist, they can the supersymmetry predicts they should exist, and if they exist, that explains several problems in particle physics, and they have just the right properties to give you the right amount of dark matter today. So, wow, it's got to be a good candidate, right?